commission meeting for Wednesday, June 13, 2018 uh, will come to order. Uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Uh, Madam Secretary, will you please uh, note the roll? Yes, Chairman Bray is present. Vice Chairman Barnes is present. Commissioner Keyes is present. Commissioner Maloney is present. Commissioner Walters is present. Commissioner Steiner is present. Commissioner Kish is absent. Chairman, we have a quorum. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, at this time, I would ask for um, a motion to excuse Commissioner Kish for this evening. Mr. Chairman, I move that we excuse Commissioner Kish for this evening. Second. It has been moved by Commissioner Barnes, seconded by Commissioner Keyes to excuse Commissioner Kish. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Thank you. Uh, just a quick note before we continue on. Um, I don't want to waste anyone's time, but on the agenda this evening, if you are here for Agenda 8.4, 8.5, 8.6, which is the uh, City of Goodyear uh, Well number 25, the Water Campus number 12, um, or the, the Water Campus number 12 rezone. If you are here for those items, those are being postponed until the June 27th um, meeting. Just so you have a, you're aware of that and don't sit through the rest. Uh, with that, I will move on to agenda, agenda item number four. Uh, the minutes from May 30th, 2018, and entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve the draft minutes of the Planning and Zoning Commission from May 30, 2018. Second. It has been uh, moved by Commissioner Walter, seconded by Commissioner Steiner to approve the minutes from May 30th. Is there any discussion? No. No. Discussion seeing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Agenda item number five is public comments. At this time, this is the agenda item where any citizen may address the Planning and Zoning uh, Commission on any non-agenda items. Do we have anybody to, or any speakers cards? All right. Agenda item number six is disclosure of ex parte communications. Commissioners, anything to disclose? No. no. Thank no. you. We'll move right into old business. Agenda item 7.1 is the El Cedro Beezer final planned area development. And I don't know who's presenting on that. Is that my continued? Nobody? Somebody? They're, I'm sorry. The, these two items are being continued as well, but oh. we needed a motion on these. I um, probably should have read my script so. a little further. <laughs> okay, so. Um, Agenda item 7.1 and 7.2. We'll just start with 7.1. Can I get a motion to move those to June 27th? Postpone until to June 27th. Mr. Chairman, I move that we postpone agenda item 7.1 to the June 27th meeting. Second. Been moved by Commissioner Walters, seconded by Commissioner Keyes to postpone agenda item 7.1. El Cedro Beezer final plan, uh, plan Area development to June se June twenty seventh, two thousand eighteen. Is there any discussion? No. Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, say sign. Motion carries. Uh, agenda item seven point two. I will entertain another motion to postpone the El Cedro final plan area development to June twenty seventh, two thousand eighteen. Mr. Chairman, I move that we postpone item seven point two to the meeting on June twenty seventh. Second. It has been moved by Commissioner Walters, seconded by Commissioner Steiner to uh, postpone agenda item 7.2 to the June 27, 2018 Planning and Zoning meeting. Is there any discussion? No. Nope. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. New business. I will open the public hearing on the uh, Christopher Todd communities at Canyon Trails, and Alex is already there to present. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman, members of the Commission. The Christopher Todd Communities at Canyon Trails, PAD. Um, the subject property is located at the southwest corner of Van Buren and the 303. 
Um, it's just east of Canyon Trails Unit 4 West. The property is currently zoned PAD under the Canyon Trails uh, Master Planned Area Development. Um, and a portion of the subject property, which is on the right, is zoned for commercial, the majority of the parcel. Um, the, the remainder is zoned for court home residential. The request tonight is to pull the subject property out of the Canyon Trails PAD and create a singular PAD that would allow for a single story multifamily residential for the Christopher Todd communities. In 2017, the commission reviewed a request for an amendment to the Estrella Commons PAD. Um, if you remember that one, that was lo located at the northwest corner of Van Buren and Estrella Parkway, which included nearly identical development standards to allow for the Christopher Todd's community development as well. These are the development standards included in the Christopher Todd, commu Christopher Todd communities at Canyon Trails. I'm gonna say that a lot. Um, the bolded items are deviated from uh, the city's multifamily 18 standards. Um, some notable items include the maximum height is one story. So 16 feet maximum height for the residential buildings and a 20 foot maximum height for accessory buildings, which includes office, the, or the main office and the fitness center. Um, additionally, outer boundaries of the properties uh, make up the backyards of the units. So those building setbacks um, in the, the middle uh, of that table uh, include the backyards of each unit. So, uh, and then along 173rd and Van Buren, the applicant worked with staff to provide additional landscaping to enhance the streetscape, as well as remain consistent with the existing neighborhood. This is an image of the conceptual landscape plan. Uh, one thing to note is that the rezone does not approve a site plan. It just creates regulations to the property. So if Christopher Todd no longer wants to develop on the site, the development standards that I just showed on the previous slide would apply to any future development. Um, the conceptual site plan includes 261 units, both one and two bedrooms. The main entry of the site is off 173rd Avenue, which is where the office and uh, the main entry is located. The, there is an exit only onto Van Buren Street. The traffic study for the rezone was reviewed by city staff and approved. The study anticipated a decrease in trips generated compared to the, a commercial use of the property. A traffic signal is anticipated at the intersection of 173rd and Van Buren. The developer is required to, to pay a proportionate share of that signal um, and will be built when the traffic signal is warranted. Amenities on the site include a pool, a fitness center, um, along with some smaller parks you can see throughout the site. These are some of the conceptual elevations on the project. On the left side of the image um, are the one bedroom units. These come in packs of two, so there's two one bedroom units on the left side, and then on the right side are the two bedroom units, which are single units. On February 28th, the city hosted a neighborhood meeting uh, for the applicant to receive public input. About five residents attended this meeting. The residents were from the adjacent Canyon Trails Unit 4 neighborhood. They appeared to be in favor of the rezone from commercial to single story multifamily residential. Um, they had expressed concerns related to the neighborhoods specifically the Canyon Trails neighborhood, but not any concerns related to the rezone before you tonight. So based on the city's requirements for zoning and engineering standards, the applicant has demonstrated compliance. Therefore, staff is recommending approval subject to the stipulations in the draft ordinance. The applicant is available for questions or pre presentation if you would like. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Does anybody have questions for staff at this time? No. None. Uh, would the applicant, would, does the applicant wish to address the commission this evening? No. Okay. I'm sure you've done this before, but just for the record, your name and address, please. <clears throat> My pleasure. My name is Paul Gilbert, 701 North 44th Street in Phoenix. I'm pleased to be here on behalf of the Christopher Todd Communities. Uh, this is a multifamily project, but it is a very unique multifamily project. We uh, actually function more like a grouping of attached and detached single family dwellings. Uh, some of you may remember we were here before with this same product, in which was 
approved with, I might add, uh, more than a modicum of enthusiasm when we were here last time. So we have the same project, different location, but it functions very much similarly. Uh, we propose all single story buildings that look more like small cottages than apartments. This is a very unique concept and it's very popular. Um, and we are pleased uh, at the reception we have received so far. Each unit has a private backyard and there is a resort style pool area with spa, cabanas, cooking amenities, and a fitness center. Uh, we cater to a niche market in that our people are renters by choice. People that come and participate in our project aren't forced because they can't get a home or some other reason. They come because they want to rent, and that's a unique situation uh, for our project. We're limited to one- and two-bedroom homes. Uh, the quality of these units, I think, is worth mentioning. Uh, we have 10-foot ceilings, granite countertops, high-end appliances, a host of new smart home technology features that include digital thermostats, lighting controls, doorbells with cameras, keyless entry, and anything else you can imagine. So uh, this is a real quality project. Uh, as noted, and uh, Alex did a very thorough and complete job, makes my job much easier, So, and actually for you too, because you don't have to listen to me so much tonight, given Alex's fine presentation. Um, just a couple of highlights. We're at about 13.36 units per acre. We have 260 total homes, 106 are one bedroom, 154 are two bedroom. Uh, we have no three bedroom units here. Uh, the main access, as you saw from the site plan, is off of 130, 173rd Avenue. Uh, we are providing less intensity than what could be placed on the property under the existing commercial PAD zoning. Um, we also have some minor deviations from the zoning ordinance. I don't intend to regale you with details on those uh, unless you wish a more lengthy discussion. I'm paid by the word, so I'm very happy to do so, but I think they would be rather boring, and basically they're all justified due to the unique nature of this uh, project. We held a community outreach meeting, and frankly, there were some concerns by the neighbors when the five neighbors appeared. Uh, but after we explained the project, they were very delighted. And I asked at the end of the meeting, all right, do any of you have any problems with this project? And no one did. So based on our neighborhood meeting, I think we're here before you tonight in a posture of solid support. Uh, the planning staff has indicated in their report to you that we are consistent with the general plan. And we are also in agreement with all of the stipulations. There's much more that could and may be said about this project, but I think I've said enough to justify a vote for approval. But if not, I can keep going. So, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, I'll leave it at that and see where we are. Thank you, sir. Uh, with that, does uh, anyone have any questions for the applicant at this time? Oh, Mr. Walters, please proceed. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Gilbert, I'm curious about the fact that the property is currently zoned commercial in part and yeah. what, why the movement away from developing a commercial aspect given the very close proximity to the 303. Well, first of all, this is an excellent site for multifamily as well. And we have the owner of the property here, Mr. Bruce Hilgby, and I'm sure he will tell you that there just has been no market for commercial development at this site. And by the way, a portion of the site is already zoned for apartments. So we, uh, the, candidly, the majority is zoned for commercial, but there is a small part of it that's zoned that way. 
So bottom line is there's a market for this product and not a market for the zoning that is on the property now. Huh. More questions? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gilbert, I noticed that this is going to be a gated community on in the entrance and exit off to 173rd, I think it is. Yes, the main entrance is off of 173rd. Right. Is there going to be a mechanism by which a car can go around if there's a car that's sitting there at the gate and they don't have the right code and they're trying to get in? I have a concern about traffic backing up onto 173rd. Uh, your concern is car stacking on 173rd? Right. Okay. Well, um, our access code works very quickly. It's a card in, card out, and you're in. Okay. So you don't have to punch in a lot of numbers and so on. Um, yeah. And Andy also points out to me that the gates are off to the side, so that I think also. Yeah. No. Unless they ask. Okay. All right. <laughs> Does that satisfy your question, Commissioner Walters? Unfortunately not. I guess I'm not understanding how it is that All traffic right. well, could back up onto 173rd. So you get a yep. chance to shine. All right. Give your name and address. Uh, Clayton Nelson, Westland Resources, 2020 North Central Park. Uh, Central Avenue, suite number 695, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, just to explain a little bit about it, I guess. Oops, that doesn't do it. Where's your pointer? There's no pointer? Okay. So as you come in the entrance, the uh, the uh, gates are to each side. You can see the, the kind of the shaded area that's kind of a brown. At each end of that, there are gates. So you have that whole area in front of there in, the, in front of the office in that where they can actually turn around in there. Is pretty wide. It'd be a little easier if there was a pointer and I could point on there, but. Yep. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. So you have a gate here and a gate here. And as they come in, they can actually circle around, turn here, go back out. That does it. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions for the applicant at this time? Thank you again. Appreciate your time. My pleasure. Um, with that, are there any um, members of the audience that would like to address the commission on this issue? Yeah. Or any speaker cards? None? Oh, okay. All right. That being said, is there any last discussion or questions, actually questions, by the commission? No? Nope. No. Okay. I will close the public hearing, and I will ask uh, for a motion to approve uh, the Christopher Todd communities at Canyon Trails. Mr. Chairman, I move that we uh, approve 18-210-0001. And Second. Yeah. It has been uh, moved by Commissioner Steiner, seconded by Commissioner Maloney, to approve the Christopher Todd communities at Canyon Trails pad. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, we will move into um, agenda item 8.2, which is a use permit for swimming pool in the front yard at the residence uh, on uh, Santo Thomas Drive. And I will open the public hearing. And Christopher, you're going to present. I'm going to introduce, thank you, Mr. Chairman, if you'll entertain me for just a second. Absolutely. And then uh, Mr. Schmitz will come present the present the case as, we, as staff normally does. Perfect. I just wanted to uh, take a moment of privilege, if I may, for just a second. Um, as you know, we in our building development services and engineering work very closely together, and we really consider ourselves one team. We've made quite a few improvements, not only in our processes, but also in our procedures some of which the Planning Commission has contributed to, and we thank you for that. And we're, we're immensely proud of the accomplishments that we've made in, in our customer service. However, tonight I'm before you in a, um, a, a not our best uh, moment to shine, if, if to speak frankly. 
uh, back in January, the end of January, a pool permit was submitted um, and reviewed and approved. Um, and the permit was issued and the, and the homeowners um, began construction of a pool. We subsequently uh, became aware of the issue and learned that the permit was issued in error out of sequence. The, the zoning ordinance does contemplate pools and front yards, but only with a approval of a use permit. So we had a permit, a building permit that was issued prior to a use permit. So we're coming back through following the ordinances now in order to get this cleaned up. So uh, we, there was an error that was made. Um, we are human, um, and, but we strive to deliver excellent customer service and would like to apologize publicly to the homeowners for the inconvenience and angst that this error had caused. Um, but we're here today to make amends to the error and to, to move forward in a positive fashion. And if you would like to know anything about what this city has do done in order to uh, correct the, the actions that took place so that this error doesn't happen again, Rebecca Zook, our engineering director, could, could answer those questions if you have them. If you don't have any, I'll turn the uh, podium over to Joe Schmitz, who will walk you through the case. I'm considering here at least a brief moment of executive session for the commission to discuss this situation prior to. Sure, it's your privilege. And I think I, I would like I would like the opportunity to do that. So sure. uh, with that, I would call it an executive session for uh, for the commission, and then we can we'll, we'll be right back. We'll be right back. Yes.
bring the order, uh, the meeting back to order. Um, appreciate you bearing with us for that quick period of time. And with that, um, I think uh, I'll just make it clear. I'm opening the public hearing and Joe, please uh, continue with the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this is a use permit for a swimming pool in the front yard of a residence at 97, 9697 Santo Tomas Drive, which is a uh, lot 31 of Australia parcel nine. And this is an aerial photograph of the subject property. It's outlined in red. And you can see that this is a custom home uh, subdivision with uh, a, a fair number of uh, vacant lots yet to be uh, constructed. So the zoning ordinance allows swimming pools to be constructed in the side yards and the rear yards of single of residential districts subject to certain minimum setbacks, primarily five feet from the property line. So in those instances, the pool can actually encroach into the yard, but it requires a use permit when it's proposed in the front setback, in the front yard of a, of a residence. And the front yard is considered that portion of the yard that is between the front property line and the front of the building. Uh, the front setback of this property is a minimum of 30 feet normally for buildings. Uh, however, that is not particularly applicable to a swimming pool. In this particular case, the swimming pool is proposed at a setback of about 25 feet from the front property line and the home itself is set back about 45 feet from the front property line. So there is an area at the front of the home that the property owner is interested in developing as a swimming pool. <clears throat> the proposed pool would be, uh, the, uh, this is a copy of the plot plan that was submitted with the building permit application. And you can see that uh, this is the, the 26, four inches to the, roughly the edge of the pool. And there are two retaining walls planned in front of that in a step down fashion so that this area can be uh, flat for the swimming pool installation. The property rises from the street to the front of the residence here, probably about eight to 10 feet. And so that's why these retaining walls are being installed uh, the fact that it rises uh, above the adjoining grade at the street level uh, makes this uh, home and the proposed swimming pool attractive for the vistas that you get from the property. Um, it is probably one of the highest points in the community of Goodyear and uh, provides uh, outstanding or extraordinary views. A, uh, we noted in the staff report that the, uh, the, the area at the front of the home could accommodate a, a patio uh, as long as it was uncovered, which would be uh, similar to uh, a, an uncovered swimming pool. Uh, and uh, an e-wall itself could be placed in the front yard uh, without the requirement of any use permits. Uh, we uh, uh, entered into this process because, as Mr. Uh, Baker indicated, the, the initial building permit was issued uh, without the benefit of a use permit for first being obtained. And so now this is the use permit process we're going through to uh, establish a use permit for the property, and then the building permit can be issued and construction resumed. Uh, work was stopped uh, when it was learned that the, that the uh, use permit had not first been obtained. And the uh, property owner has been cooperative in stopping construction and submitting an application to obtain the use permit. The use permit requires notification of the joining property owners and notice has been provided. Uh, a neighborhood meeting uh, was not conducted because of the uh, few resident actual structures in the area. Uh, in response to a notice of application that we sent out, we did receive one 
uh, comment and question from an adjoining property owner uh, asking for clarification of some of the measurements and what was planned for the pool. I will point out for the record that we have received one letter or email uh, in opposition to the proposed use permit. Uh, it is a conditional objection in which the uh, objector notes that uh, the objection would be withdrawn if the homeowner would agree to the construction of a clear glass sound barrier or wall around the pool. And without that, they would maintain their objection. This property, uh, the property that filed the objection is this lot here, which is owned by uh, Sun MP, who also owns the next two lots over as well. This is just a little bit blown up uh, version of the plot plan so you can see the dimensions maybe a little better. This is a rendering of what the pool would look like. And so basically you have the 26 feet setback comes to about this part of the pool. And then these are the retaining walls that are in a step down fashion uh, to provide level grade for the construction of the pool which would also have a, a spa attached to it. Use permits are subject to uh, two review criteria. One is that the proposed use is reasonably compatible with uses permitted in the surrounding area. Um, and the second is that the use permit will not materially be materially detrimental to persons residing or working in the vicinity adjacent to the property, the neighborhood, or the public welfare. <clears throat> uh, staff has evaluated this uh, request and believes that because of the size of the lot and the nature of the topography, the setback of the home, uh, and initially at the, at the time the staff report was prepared, there were no objections filed. We felt that the use permit was reasonable and should be approved. Uh, the concerns that were raised in the objection um, are, are not, in our opinion, sufficient to uh, warrant us changing our recommendation. Uh, there are no standards in the zoning ordinance relative to sound barriers related to swimming pools. Uh, the, the requirement that is in the zoning ordinance is that there be a fence around the swimming pool of a minimum height of five feet and that any gates uh, <clears throat> that have, provide access through the fence the latches have to be a minimum of four and a half feet high, which is intended to prevent children from accessing the pool uh, without uh, supervision. So based on that uh, discussion, we find that the use permit is uh, compatible with the existing land uses in the area uh, and is a, a use that is commonly associated with residential homes. Uh, the fact that it's located in the front yard in this instance, uh, it would not be detrimental to the surrounding properties, given you know, the, the uh, topography, the nature of the area available in the front of the house uh, and, and the setback of the, of the existing structure. So that concludes uh, my remarks. Uh, the owners, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Eric uh, and Amy Herman are present if there's any questions of the, of the property owners. Uh, thank you, Joe. Does anybody have questions for staff at this time? Uh, can we, oh. I do. Sorry, um, I have, my only question is, um, I'm concerned about the precedent that we are setting by approving something like that. Uh, Chairman Bray, uh, Commissioner Maloney, uh, the, anytime you uh, approve a use permit or a special use permit which uh, singles out an individual property for uh, se uh, separate treatment, you run the risk of establishing some sort of precedent. However, in this instance, given the, the amount of area that's available in the front yard, uh, it is a custom lot. It's a large lot. It's a minimum of an acre. Um, it, it seems appropriate that the use permit provides us with the mechanism where it can be considered on an individual case-by-case -case basis. 
if this were a production home, uh, not only would it probably not be recommended, it probably wouldn't work in a production home setting because the front yard is not big enough for the swimming pool. And if it happens to be large enough, the fenced enclosure that would be required would, would violate other provisions of the zoning ordinance and, and would not be practically allowed. You would really, it would need to be on a large piece of property uh, in similar circumstances. And uh, so it, it could provide a precedent for some other requests, but it would be on a property that would ha have to be similarly situated and configured in, in our opinion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think to follow up um, with Joe on that, I think the important piece out of that is that uh, there is no precedent sent for us in the future or for any future commissions under the use permit, so. Mr. Chairman, if I may interject one second, if you'll indulge me for a moment. Also, as Joe pointed out, uh, there's the evaluation criteria for the use permit, which is uh, the permits not uh, will not be materially detrimental to persons residing or working in, in the vicinity of the property, as well as the use is reasonably compatible with uses in the surrounding area and so forth. So. Um, there is already a test embedded in the ordinance that any other application anywhere else in the city would have to meet in order to do that. And as Joe pointed out, the unique circumstances of this property, given the size of it and the topography, um, uh, make us comfortable with, with this project meeting this test. Thank you for that clarification. Commissioner Maloney, is that? Yes, any thank you. Questions? Yep. Commissioner Walters? Of course, I have a question. Um, so in the email from Todd Tupper on behalf of the homeowner to the east, the parcel that you pointed out, there was a second condition um, that I don't think you've addressed, which is that he requested the 26 foot setback be measured from the apex closest point to the home of the cul-de-sac. Could you explain that and let me know what you think about that, please? Yes, Commissioner Bray, uh, uh, Chairman Bray, Commissioner Walters. Uh, to be honest, I, ha I struggled understanding that a little bit myself. As you can see on the plot plan, the 26 4 appears to be from the farthest point toward the house as it is. So I'm not 100% sure what, what the point uh, was that Mr. Tupper was trying to make. Um, so I... I that's the best answer I can give because I, I frankly don't totally understand it. Yeah, I see this email was yesterday evening. You've not had an opportunity, I take it, to speak to Mr. Tupper given how recent the email was? No, I, I responded to his email, uh, but I had not had any further contact beyond that. Okay. Could we go back to the rendering, please? I think it's a lovely rendering. I don't recommend black metal uncushioned furniture in Arizona. However, <laughs> I just I just think that's important for all concerned. But I think that the rendering is lovely, but it's not a vantage point relevant to a neighbor or someone at the street. Will this pool be visible from someone walking by the property or from a neighbor in their yards? In other words, my backyard pool is not visible to a neighbor. Is this pool visible to other people? Well, I think if we go back to the, well, let me go. Uh, um, so the pool is going to be at the front of the property. And as I indicated, with the retaining walls, they're going to be eight to ten. That the surface of the pool is going to be eight to ten feet above the street grade. So, to answer your question with respect to someone walking by, um, if people are in the water, I don't think they're going to see people in the water. Would they see people sitting on the pool deck? Perhaps, um, but it, it's it would probably be partially obstructed. Um, I'm not fam as familiar with the property maybe as I should be to answer your question with respect to the other uh, adjacent lots and perhaps the uh, perhaps the homeowner could enlighten us as to uh, what they know about their their home and their surrounding lots 
to answer your question. Yeah, I, I have a lot of respect for the homeowners wanting to uh, improve the property for their enjoyment, but I'm deeply concerned about the neighboring parcels that must also be at somewhat of an elevation. It's not as though this lot just juts up on its own and there aren't, there isn't an elevation on the neighboring lots. They're not occupied right now. And I'm just concerned for the future about whether the pool would be visible and whether it has to be visible um, to those future residents. Well, I think Katie's gonna come to the rescue. Can can I have Elmo, please? So I don't, I don't know if you wanna try and use, this is a Google street view. So this is as close as we can get, but um, you can see, cause the house is already built, the patio is right there. So that's about where the pool would be correct. And the new walls are going along this area that's rocky that you can already see the, the hill already exists. So they're gonna do the retaining walls in that portion so the patio already exists. So this is about what you'd see from the public street. You can see there's no sidewalks in the neighborhood. It looked to me like from the rendering that the pool is higher than the retaining walls. Is that correct? Can we go back to the other? Oops. Maybe a matter of perspective, perspective because of the angle. So that's what I'm trying to clarify. Uh, we might ask the, uh, besides the property owner, the pool contractors here, and perhaps uh, in, in an effort to answer that question, they, they might be able hey, to Joe. do that. Any other questions for Joe at this time? No. They are probably right here. Yes. <clears throat> Can't go far. Um, with that, I will ask um, the Herman family if you would like to present or the pool contractor, whoever would like to go first. Name and address for the record, please. Eric Herman, 9697 Santo Tomas Drive, Goodyear. Amy Herman, also 9697 Santo Tomas Drive, Goodyear, Arizona, 85338. And we brought our lovely kids here <laughs> to ask themselves. First and foremost, I want to thank Joe, Chris, and the staff. Obviously, there was an unfortunate situation that kind of happened, and they've been nothing but exceptional in really this trying time. So I give definite credit to, to them and in, in helping us uh, get to this point in, in, a, in a very uh, positive manner. So I just say that. Um, we wrote a little something and, and have uh, some, some backup. Uh, that kind of want to bring up to kind of add to the file here. Um, you know, we definitely in agreement with with the, uh, with Joe, Chris, and staff that uh, you know, obviously want you guys to have that. And Christopher Todd enthusiasm here a little bit to, <laughs> to get us through this. And uh, but thank you. <clears throat> um, there is another pool in Goodyear that has a front yard uh, pool, so there already is that precedence. Kind of answering your mm -hmm. question, one three one three two West Beverly Road over by. Uh, Indian Springs by the racetrack. It's actually was ran as a bed and breakfast for a while, but it does have a front yard pool and a pool house and recently changed hands. And um, so you already have one. I did also bring some uh, tax records of other cities around and Glendale and your Phoenixes, your Scottsdales, your, they, they all have front yard pools. So as far as a precedence, they are around and typically they follow in line with something that, would make sense. I, you know, have some sort of view or there's something that actually could, uh, um, you know, really function for, for a front yard pool. So, so I did have that and I will, I will leave that with you guys. I didn't put all, I have a research database with a lot more, but kind of threw in a one from pretty much every city that, that, that could. Um, <clears throat> we also have several of our neighbors that are here. I'm not sure they're going to want to speak, but lot owners of the same parcel in the same area that uh, are very much supportive of you know, our front yard pool. The retaining walls that are there, there's two of them. So part of the HOA stipulation was that they can't do a front yard water feature. So that is designed by Dolphin Pool, which we have the Dolphin Pool here today, um, within I think six inches of that infinity edge. 
So from the street level, no, you cannot see the pool because you're looking up at an angle. But theoretically, up on the deck, we won't see the wall. So it's something that we worked very closely with them to really construct something that is almost, almost even, but does allow the, the look and feel. So from that street level, no, you will not see. You almost have to be halfway up our driveway in order to even be above that retaining wall fence line to actually see any pool. Um, I, I also just wanted to uh, note because the concern was raised about the adjoining properties being able to see it as well. And it was difficult to, sh to see in the rendering of the Google Maps, but there's a wash on either side of the home. And the next properties are significantly lower. So from their property, it does not appear that they would even be able to see over the fence, the retaining wall. Um. <clears throat> I, no, I think those are kind of the two uh, main points um, that I just want to get across. So I want to thank you guys very much, and I know I have a question or two, and I'd love to be able to help answer. No, uh, thank you uh, for, for coming. Um, any questions at this time for the homeowners? No. None? No? Thank you. Appreciate you uh, coming out and working so closely with our staff. I think uh, I will echo their uh, their comments, and we apologize for uh, the mistake and and uh, we appreciate you taking it on and and working with our staff to correct it and uh, sorry for the delay so hopefully we can move it along and and finish it up so and thanks for involving the kids so <laughs> I think that's, uh, yeah. they can see how how sausage is made so they say exactly so thank, thank you, you guys thank you very much for your time um are there any other questions for staff or maybe the pool builder since they are here none oh I'm sorry thank you Joe um, yes please and just yes please come forward and, and your name and uh, uh, your address and if you haven't filled out a speaker card I'm sorry, I didn't. that's fine go ahead and gonna... Joe will get you the the information and anybody that wants to come forward from the public please do at this time uh, Rebecca Brecky. Uh, 9233 South Krista Drive East. So I'm on the loop. If, if we pull up that map, mm -hmm. will that, uh, mm -hmm. can we go back to that sure. map just so that commissioners can kind of see which one that might be or close to? Where am I? I'm here. Okay. That's me. Okay. Oh. Um, just two things I wanted to say. I walk this loop every day and it's it it will not be a distraction at all i will not see people swimming up there i mean it is high enough up and i was also going to say that sound doesn't travel out there <laughs> i really can't even hear my neighbors not not that i have very many but it's really sound doesn't travel very much so if that doesn't help all i have to say thank you thank you same thing ma'am name and address for the record and then when uh before you leave just fill out a speaker card please of course uh susan schmelzer 9735 south san marcos drive west good year um i am in the house uh directly uh to the right across that first uh circle oh is there a pointer okay no down Right, right there. Okay, there you go. It may still show as dirt. I'm fairly new. <laughs> <laughs> I moved in in January, but I can say that. Look, this this is a custom home area. Um, what you want to see in the different homes is uniqueness <laughs> um, and beautification, and I think that's what all the residents here try to do. Um, including, you know, uh, the home in question with the pool. Um, from my view, it is very much uphill to the home. Um, I think even the adjacent lots are quite a bit down um, from the uh, address in question. And just uh, from seeing the retaining walls at this stage um, with the bright pink paint <laughs> to make sure that no more work is done, um, you can still tell it's going to be a very beautiful 
uh, site. My home actually has some retaining walls around it, um, two, three layers with flowers and things like that. And it really does look pretty when you're driving up. Um, you know, the home in question is in a cul-de-sac. Um, so any uh, through traffic is on a road well below. Um, and quite honestly, if you go up that road, the pool is actually in the side <laughs> of the road. Um, so I fully support it. I fully support the uniqueness of it and how it's going to beautify the neighborhood. And, you know, I have no concerns whatsoever. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Again, name and address for the record, please. Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Rafaela Gilmore, uh, 16474 West San Pedro Circle. Um, in Goodyear, our house is exactly here, this, this house. Um, I, I see the house from um, my house, and we also walk every day that circle, and we pass the house and it is really high on the hill. Um, I don't think that you would ever see the water. Maybe you would see a uh, hat sticking out. I don't even know if you would, but um, I uh, support um, everything. Actually, what my neighbors also said, it would bring value to the neighborhood and uniqueness is a nice thing to have there. That's, Every house has something different, and I think it would look wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Any further public comments on this item? Seeing none, last chance for questions on staff or the applicant. All right, with that, I will close the public hearing, and I will ask for a motion uh, for approval um, on the uh, use permit for a swimming pool in the front yard. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve item 18-300-00002. Second. It has been moved by Commissioner Barnes, seconded by Commissioner Steiner uh, to approve the use permit. Is there any discussion? Discussion seeing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. No. Motion carries. Thank you guys for coming out and, and bearing with us on that one. One we haven't seen before. But now you can add it to your research, hopefully. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, we will move on to agenda item 8.3. This is, uh, I will open the public hearing on the amendment of the PV303 planned area of development. Um, and, oh, Steve, you are here. You were hiding out back there. So. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chair, Commission members. I do have a PAD amendment before you this evening. It is for the PV303 PAD. And this slide shows you the basic outline of the PAD, Loop 303, Indian School Road, right here. About uh, 1,700, 1,800 acres for the total PAD. Uh, rezoned 2005-2007, and since that time, we've had several amendments to the overall PAD. And as you can see, the land uses are generally industrial, this gray, and some commercial areas in the orange. And primarily, that's due to uh, the presence of Luke Air Force Base up here to the northeast. You can see the noise contour lines you can see the accident potential zones that uh, encompass this property. So again, that's why you see the non-residential uses for this PAD. So tonight's action is this portion right here, what is known as West 3, this section of land right here, cotton and citrus, Thomas and Indian School. And zooming in, what we have is that section of land here again, Thomas Road, Cotton Lane. And what we're looking at is a two-part request 
for this area here, about 310 acres, uh, press for a height increase from 75 feet to 130 feet. And then a portion, that commercial piece, I'm gonna go back right here, north of where Thomas Road will kind of curve, that will go from commercial to industrial. So again, back to aerial photo. And what we have surrounding this area here, this is P80 industrial here. Agricultural land to the west, uh, to the south, this is the state prison complex here, all designated as industrial in the general plan. Uh, we have the 303 here and more commercial industrial land <coughs> surrounding this amendment area. Because it is a PAD amendment, we provided notice for a public hearing. Uh, we provided notice to the surrounding property owners. Uh, that does include uh, Luke Air Force Base and the state. Uh, we did not get any inquiries or public opposition to this. Luke Air Force Base has commented that the PAD amendment, including the height increase, will not adversely affect base operations. Uh, and what we have here this area here for the PAD amendment. In working with the applicant, they have had some inquiries on users that want increased height. And staff and the applicant work together to designate this area as that area that could be appropriate for increased height. What you have is a piece of property that's the furthest away from Luke Air Force Base, furthest away from any residential, which is up here to the northwest, the Sedea community. And then across the freeway over here, we have this natural barrier right here. So this seemed to be the most appropriate area to allow increased height. Uh, no specific user is, the, we have no site plans or any specific user. The applicant just wanted to be prepared that if they do get someone wants to go under contract for this piece that they are ready for that increased height. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, we did, staff did review this PAD amendment. We do find it consistent with the general plan. We do find it compatible with the surrounding area. Uh, we are recommending approval subject to the stipulations in the staff report. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm available for any questions. The applicant's also here with any questions. Thank you, Steve, I appreciate it. Um, any questions for Steve at this time? Mm -hmm. Oh, I have one, well, yeah, um, Steve, <laughs> 130 feet. Is there any other buildings of that height in the area currently? Mr. Chair, Commission members, nothing close to 130 feet. The height limit right now is the 75 feet. If I remember correctly, some of the buildings out there approaching 50, 60 feet. The applicant could clarify if there's anything taller but that's kind of what you see now. Could you give us an idea as to what might go into a building needing 130 feet? Mr. Chair, Commission members, what we have seen increase in the past is not necessarily large buildings that tall, but some of these operations have support equipment that might need to go taller. And that height limit is also a limit for any kind of support equipment. Maybe they need a small tower or something for their operations. Generally, we don't see the request for 130 foot tall building, but potentially for the support equipment that goes along with whatever operation they're doing, any kind of, kind of industrial operation. I apologize, I do not have a specific example. We don't have a specific user that's for sure going here. Okay. I guess I'm still unclear, so maybe more specific examples as to what would need 130 feet for support equipment. I, I'm not understanding, I'm sorry. Mr. Chair, Commission members, I think several years ago, maybe Harry Paxton could elaborate. There was an inquiry about a property owner who did some kind of glass work and it required a tall where they would melt the glass and come down. So it wasn't a large 
warehouse building is 150. It's just a smaller operation where they melted it and it dropped down. If I could help, I think a prime example would be the Rubbermaid factory. They have silos that hold the plastic that are much taller than the actual facility is. In addition, uh, I, if I might add that, um, I think you might have been on the commission, but it wasn't but a few years ago, we updated these to kind of reflect what was the general, you know, to be in line with a lot more cohesive <laughs> with other cities so that we're not missing out. But I think that would be the best um, example. Or maybe you see, you know, a li liquid oxygen tank that is on the side of a building that is much taller than, than the actual building itself. Mm. If that helped, maybe, I don't know. Any further questions? No. No. Okay. Any other questions for Steve at this time? All right. Uh, the applicant's present. Would you guys like to present to the commission? Okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. If, do you have questions for the applicant? Feel free. Commissioner Keyes. Sure, sure. It has a... You know, as developers, uh, I'll give you a chance to give your name. Go ahead. Okay. My name is Troy Mortensen. I'm with Sunbelt Holdings, 6720 North Scottsdale Road, uh, Suite 250 in Scottsdale, Arizona. Okay, so as developers, you must have some idea as to the type of client that may want 130 feet, maybe? There, there have been users in the past that have come and, and, you know, like I said, Harry may be able to shed some light on this too when some of these projects, these code projects come looking um, in the high tech industry. You know, there are some buildings that need to be higher for some, like I said, ancillary equipment type uh, tanks or some type of towers for maybe a manufacturing mm -hmm. process. Um, you know, not generally the whole building, but yeah, some, some ancillary type equipment, I guess is what I would say. Would there uh, be a need for further approval at any point in the future for a specific part of that to be approved? Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, so if this proposal to revise the regulations goes through and is approved by council, essentially what it would be is um, that would be reviewed during the site plan process, also during the building permit process to make sure that the whatever proposed use is uh, meeting these uh, height allowances. Um, I hope that answers your question. Okay. The commission, there would probably be another step where an applicant would have to come to the commission as well? No, sir. It would be administrative. Okay. Administrative review to ensure conformance with the requirements. Does Luke have um, a requirement in terms of height? Can you remind me of that as well? This is all within, in accordance with whatever Luke Air Force Base may need in terms of height. I just Googled a couple pictures. So these are companies that are not looking at Goodyear or anything. <laughs> but, and two, I also want to make a point that we have higher design guidelines than others do. But... No. You may just want to pass it around up front. Yeah. But again, I, we have different types of design guidelines, so you just need to read the applicable silos. Right. And they often need them for like the press release. Right. I think Snyder Pretzel like has palm trees. As long as they're not palm trees. <laughs> Uh, Commissioner Keys, you know, um, you know, not knowing what it is we're actually approving for 130 feet gives me concern. Is it going to be a stack? Is it going to be a stack that has emissions? You know, and um, those kinds of issues. And if it doesn't have to come back to the, I mean. 
the way, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commission, the way that the ordinance is written currently, it would not, if this is moves through and is approved by council, um, it would not require any further additional action by the commission. Okay. So does the developer need the 130? All, any thought this, on to? This was, uh, and, and I'll, you know, I'll put this on, this was developed with staff too, as we had some some uses that were looking. And so this this particular location became the area that, that if we had users that would come, look like this, and we have seen users in the past um, with, with height requirements as high that, that we could we could locate them in this area and kind of, you know, this would be kind of the, the best place to keep them, um, you know, consolidated for that use. So users in the past, can you give me some examples of companies? Um, what, one, uh, one company that actually uh, purchased and has actually sold uh, Bimbo Bakeries USA, um, it's where the Ball Corporation is. Um, they had uh, silos on the side of their building that were you know, filled with flour, and, and that's where they get their stuff. And so that one at the time, too, had conflicts with height requirements there with by the time they put their, their handrails and support rails on top of the equipment, um, you know, that that was going to, you know, it, you know, go above the height, the height limitations. Mm -hmm. um, we did have one, I, I, I don't remember the code name, Harry, but there was a, you know, a manufacturer that uh, does glass type manufacturing and part of their, you know, melting process, they had to have a tower that they melt the silica up there and it kind of, you know, falls down and that's how they make the flat glass. And so it was, it was just a portion of their building would have kind of a tower on it and it wasn't going to be like the full building. But so it's, it's uses like that um, that we've, we've seen. So, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity. I'm Harry Paxton in the Economic Development Office, and so I work a lot with these industrial projects. We can give you kind of an example of some of the things that we're seeing. We're seeing a real resurgence in manufacturing. In fact, last year, of all the projects I worked on, close to 100 projects, about 75% of those were manufacturing. 13% of those were aviation aerospace. Only 11%, this is surprising to most people when I talk to them about it, were just warehouse distribution. Even the warehouse distribution, we're continuing to see 40 foot clear buildings, buildings that exceed you know 60 feet by the time you, you get to them. With manufacturing, we're continuing to see all types of manufacturing opportunities from high tech to some of your other ones that might be food or, or other areas that sometimes they have requirements to where they are exceeding 100 feet. Most of the time, those are elements with their equipment, not necessarily the building or maybe a portion of a building. So if you think about those things and how developers and how um, companies look at those opportunities, what we need is the opportunity in some areas of our city. Where would that be? This, we think, is a, is a good location to where they can have the assurance that that height is available to them. Um, so some that we have talked with, reducing some of their, their height sometimes costs in excess of hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions maybe, um, depending on what they have to do to try and reduce some of their equipment. And so in, in doing that, what happens is you don't have that assurance, then sometimes you're not really seriously considered. And so what we're trying to do is find an area that we can place those businesses that are high value, that are good wages, good jobs uh, for our community and still stay in the game in trying to recruit those, those companies. This is an area, given the setbacks that exist from the, the freeway and residential, given the prison to the south, uh, we thought that it would be a, a good opportunity to consider this, this area. So I don't think we'll have a lot of these. Most of the ones I look at don't ask for those kind of height. But some of them are ones that are, are desirable that our city will want to have the opportunity to um, to attract to our community. If that helps at all. Thank you. Have you do you have your questions over to yes. the team? Sure. Any further questions for either the applicant or staff at this time? Okay. And uh, are there any, any speakers cards? Anybody from the public? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing and I will call for a motion to approve, please. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve 
Agenda item 8.3, case number 18-200-0003. I will second. It has been moved by Commissioner Walters, seconded by Commissioner Barnes to approve the amendment to the PV 303 planned area development. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. And thanks for sticking with us this evening. Apologize. Um, I just, for legal purposes, um, I want to note that the agenda items 8, 4, 8, 5, and 8, 6 um, were inc incorrectly reflected of 2016, but the notices were for 2018. So uh, it was correctly noticed, just a little snafu there. And hopefully the attorneys at the city will be happy that I mentioned that. <laughs> it's still Rory? Yes. Yeah. That's for Rory right there. 8.7. Um, presentation by Katie. This was, I think, Commissioner Barnes brought this forward um, as a discussion point of how we're going to deal with this moving forward. So look forward to your presentation, Katie. Thank you, members of the commission. Um, I was really excited to research this stuff. It turned out to be extremely interesting. Um, as we mentioned before, we went to the National Planning Conference in New Orleans. Um, I was able to attend a session on that, plus there, it was just kind of the topic of talk during the whole entire conference. Um, so I, I hope you enjoy the presentation tonight. So um, what the presentation focuses on is, you know, I do have a little intro just to make sure we all understand what uh, is autonomous vehicles, driverless vehicles, self-driving vehicles, and what's happening today. And then the focus, um, my focus is on, you know, the infrastructure, development patterns, neighborhoods. Um, and then at the end, I do have a couple other things that are happening um, in technology that may impact development. So you probably have seen in the news, I mean, as soon as Randy said, you know, asked for this, the, the news stories exploded um, on autonomous vehicles, both good and, you know, the negative stories that have been out in the news. But um, as you know, um, Waymo is kind of leading the way, and I do have a video to show you in case you haven't seen it already, and just I wanted to give you a little warning. I, um, Laney was saying it may be a little loud, so I apologize if it's a little loud. And in case you're wondering, that is Chandler in the video, so that is in our backyard. That's pretty much the whole video, so I don't know if you need to watch the whole end of it. But again, the point is that it's it's here. <laughs> you know, they are definitely in the Phoenix community. And um, Waymo was actually set to begin commercial 
application of this before, of course, the tragic death in Tempe. But um, news reports are they are gearing up to get ready that they will have full commercial application. So this will be fully open to the public sometime this year will be launched, but plans always change. So um, yeah, so we expect this to be fully happening. So, you know, one of the questions is, well, what's going to be happening? You know, sure, Waymo may be starting, it may be testing, but what's going to happen? And, you know, this, this curve is an innovation curve that gets talked about a lot. And the idea is, you know, there's, there's always innovators who will try out anything, you know, who there's always going to be people when a new technology comes out, they're going to jump on it and try it out. And it's not till you start hitting that early majority, you know, most of us fall either in that early majority or late majority somewhere that you hit this tipping point of, okay, this thing is either going to integrate or not. So looking at a real life example, in 2007 is when the iPhone debuted. And by 2013, 50% of Americans owned a smartphone. So that was only six years before half of us were on board. In 2016, mobile data surpassed um, desktop access of the internet. And then, you know, just last year, the latest data I could find is we're at 77% of Americans own a smartphone. So in 10 years, they went from zero people owning a smartphone to 77% of us own a smartphone. Um, we access the internet via mobile data more than we do our desktops. And of course, you know, I don't, I personally, many of us don't just have one, I have two, <laughs> um, as well as a Surface and a laptop and all sorts of computers at my disposal anywhere. So again, just as an example of, it, you know, really it took about six years for that tipping point of more than half of people. And then think of all the different ways in which um, smartphones have changed what we do and how we do it. So then the thing is, okay, you know, we, we see lots of articles trying to predict how is, you know, this AV technology going to change our lives. And I just want to make a point is we, you know, we can't predict it. <laughs> and if we look at the past, we have a history of over predicting things and under predicting. And these were just two quotes I thought were kind of funny. You know, somebody from Newsweek which, you know, doesn't exist anymore, saying, you know, <laughs> basically the Internet's never going to impact us. Don't worry about it. And then, of course, somebody overemphasizing how Y2K was going to impact us. So, again, we often don't get it quite right. And I wanted to share, just for fun, a little video that you may or may not have seen before. Have you ever watched the movie you wanted to? The minute you wanted to, well, learn special well, things. That's all taken from jazz. Now any questions? From faraway places. Oakland? So where did jazz come from? Good question. Or tucked your baby in? From a phone booth? <laughs> you will. And the company that'll bring it to you, AT&T. So I don't know if you remember that. That was from 1993, that ad campaign. And of course, it's amazing how well they did predict technology. But of course, what they got wrong was how we were going to use that technology. My favorite is the pay phone where it's like, <laughs> look at I'm using my credit card and use a video. You know, they and and even the, you know, the online classroom where it's like, no, if I'm going to take a class online, I'm not going to take it with other students. I'm going to be in my PJs at home. And, you know, again, looking at the past, it seems like Predicting the technology is often successful. Predicting how we integrate that technology is not so successful. So again, as we talk about this, there's lots of predictions out there about um, autonomous vehicle technology, but we're, we're never, we don't know how it's going to change us, really. All we can do is maybe guess. <laughs> Um, so the, the main thing we talk about in the planning world is we see that there's two possible futures. The first being this utopian that often gets talked about where people don't own cars because they share cars. We've reclaimed our streets because we don't even need many of our streets anymore. And, you know, we just have this wonderful, vibrant, utopian society. Of course, the other side being a possible future where there is pavement everywhere. We have even more vehicles than we do today. Um, and, you know, it's just a hot, ugly place to live. 
the truth is likely somewhere in the middle. But the important thing for us to know is that there's certain places, dense urban places, I think San Francisco, LA, New York, where there's, it, it makes most economic sense to lean toward that utopian side because land is so valuable and um, such a hot commodity that to not have to store cars where there's such high land prices makes a lot of sense. And so they're gonna naturally go toward there. Where some suburban places where land is cheaper and there's more of a dependence on vehicles, we're gonna have an economic benefit toward the other. And it doesn't mean we're headed to that automatically, but it just means we may need to work a little bit to nudge the needle the other way. Whereas economics and the market is gonna naturally go that way for other places. Um, and what's gonna, um, some of the big things that are gonna determine this is one, you know, a, a lot of articles just assume these are electric vehicles and that they're solar powered. That's not necessarily the case. Once the technology is out there for everyone and gets cheap enough, you know, any car company could be installing this into Hummers and, you know, Explorers and giant gas guzzling cars. You know, it doesn't mean that they're gonna be these cute little Google electric cars. Um, and then of course too, even if they're electric, if they're plugging into the grid, you still need a power plant to produce that electricity. Um, but again, there is positives out there of, you know, like Tesla and their batteries, solar batteries, and that we may be able to have more solar power um, operating these things. Of course, the other assumption is that we're going to share cars. And that's because companies like Uber um, and the Waymo model have been leading out the way. But again, at some point, this is going to be open to all. And are all of us ready to share cars or do we want to own our pers own personal cars? And I know I personally, you know, one of the big things that are driving this is we all still need, you know, right now, we all still need to get to work at eight, nine o'clock, and we all still want to leave work at five o'clock. Kids still need to get to school at the same time. Kids leave school at the same time. We all need a car at the same exact time. We can't car share if we're all needing the car at the same exact time. So until some changes are made in that, car share is probably not going to be a strong model, or at the very least, we're going to have to do something with those cars during the day. Um, and then, of course, development pramp, um, patterns, as I suggested, land prices, existing land uses are going to play into this, too. And again, this stuff is already happening. Uber and Lyft are changing things. Um, the first industry that seems to be greatly impact is travel. People are not driving their car to the airport and parking it and then renting a car at their destination. They're getting Uber and Lyft to the airport. When they get somewhere, they do it. You know, they, they do the same thing. This has had negative impacts on businesses that do parking, rental cars, airports. This has has positive impacts on hotels in urban areas who may not need to rent as many parking garages as they used to, or if they own parking, they may be able to readapt them. Can they get into um, more hotel rooms? So again, it's already interesting to see how some of this is having positive and ne negative impacts in certain industries. And then just threw in there, because you may have seen some of the news that Chandler is already um, updating their parking regulations to reduce their standards because of ride hailing services and the coming autonomous vehicles. Um, again, you know, you see those reports that just make statements as if this is what's going to happen. Taxis are going to make cell phone vehicles economically unviable. The reason this is somewhat short-sighted, though, is because, again, they're, they're thinking about the payphone, that they're, they're thinking that a car is a car, but cars are changing, too. Car manufacturers aren't in charge of this. Now we have Silicon Valley making cars. So what are they gonna do to change cars? And I'll just use myself as an example. I have a two and a half year old son. My husband and I both work. We have our two car family. So under that utopian, we may get, be able to get rid of one or both of our cars. Or, you know, again, what if cars look different? And that top is a Waymark car, so that's already being developed. But again, who says what a car is? And if it's on the, you know, if you can imagine that lower right, you know, maybe when my son is 10, I buy my son a car at 10, not 17. And so now my two-car family becomes a three-car family because I bought my son a car, you know, when he could just 
you know, start going places by himself. <laughs> and then, of course, we're, when we're talking about autonomous vehicles, again, we're not just talking about cars. Here's another example. <laughs> So, um, you know, Amazon is spending a lot of money delivering packages. If you don't think that they're looking into this technology, you are incorrect. <laughs> um, so now the question is not just how are autonomous vehicles going to impact our roads, but how are they going to impact our sidewalks? Are we okay with how they're going to impact our sidewalks and paths and trails? And of course, we can look at inside the car. Now that I don't have to drive, what happens to the interior of the car? Um, my car can become a computer. And again, who would have thought 20 years ago that I would have two tiny little computers in my hand, one issued to me by the city, if my car is a computer and I can get work done while I'm driving, is the city of Goodyear going to issue me my own car now as an employee? So again, thinking of my family, I now have five cars <laughs> <laughs> instead of two because we each have our personal and city issued vehicle and I have one for my kid and maybe my kid has one for school and one for fun too. So maybe it's actually six vehicles we have. So again, this can go a lot of different ways. We don't know what's going to be happening. Um, and again, I, I just think it's good for us to be thinking of all this. Because, um, well, I'll get into some of that more. Um, one of the other interesting things, too, to think about is just as a city government, how does this impact our sanitation services? Um, there. So I have this as a video. Imagine a world where everything that can be connected is connected. A more environmentally friendly world where emissions are reduced and safety improved. A world where automation is a natural part of any workplace. To us, it's reality. Our refuse truck manages obstacles in a more accurate and safer way, as it never gets distracted by emotions or stress, and have a far better surrounding view. Relevant data is relayed to the driver in real time to enable route optimization. Using automation like this will substantially reduce environmental impact and contribute to a more efficient and safer society for everyone. So once again, it's already being developed. <laughs> And, you know, there's a lot of be money to be made in these different technologies. Um, but again, if you think about automating the garbage truck, is that just putting, taking a payphone and adding a video screen? Why would I have a garbage truck that goes to my house when my garbage can could go to the garbage truck, which is already being developed as well? 
But of course then, why would I even have a garbage truck in the first place? As soon as I fill a bag of garbage, I'll just call the drone on my app and it'll take my bag of garbage away. Or like we saw Roby, maybe have little Robies that take garbage away from my home whenever I need to, rather than even sanitation service. And if I like it so much, maybe it even is privatized. Who knows how this is going to be impacted? And yeah, that is a picture from Back to the Future 3 because they predicted it. Had their little garbage can in the movie driving around. <laughs> Love it. And of course, those things aren't me making things up. People are already looking into how do we use drones for garbage collection. So impact to our development patterns. You know, again, we see a lot, especially at the beginning when this is coming, you know, maybe on freeways, there would be like an autonomous vehicle lane so that they're kind of separate. You know, that may be some of the first integration we see of especially the driverless trucks that are coming. Um, but eventually, be because cars can be smaller and because they're much better at driving, we may be able to reduce the right of way. And that's going to be one of the big decisions for us as a community is what would we do with that excess right of way? Are we going to regreen it? Is it going to be, you know, used by the community? Or are we going to sell it off to private developers? Are we going to sell it to Waymo, who may want a Waymo car lane and come knocking on our door asking to purchase or lease our right of way? And it'll be really hard to say no if we need money. Yeah. You know, those, those are the decisions that are going to be facing our community and other communities. Again, another example, one of the big impacts is, are we going to need the parking lots? Um, you know, and this is the Target Center on Litchfield. And just as an example, again, first phase would probably be, hey, there's this great lot right next to the road that I could develop. And you could see them, you know, Target wants to create a little drop-off center and they don't need as much parking, so can I develop that pad site? I would definitely see, you know, in coming very near years, getting proposals like this to just reduce parking in some sections. You know, there's predictions that we won't need parking at all. Um, but of course, one of the big questions is retail is changing so much. Will we even have Target around <laughs> to have a parking lot? So who knows what the development pattern is going to be? <laughs> um, and again, just this is an example in San Francisco where someone um, reimagined a parking garage. And could it be, how could I take existing parking garages and turn it into housing? So besides the, you know, we work in the horizontal, others work in the vertical. But of course, other requests we'll probably get soon once this hits the streets is, hey, I don't have cars. Can't I take my garage and convert it to something else? Right now, our zoning ordinance requires that you have two covered parking spaces. So we require the garage. But of course, what's going to happen when residents say, I, you know, I personally don't need my garage, I don't need my driveway. Um, again, those are probably questions that are going to face us sooner rather than later, because those, those innovators <laughs> are going to adopt this technology and, and want to um, incorporate it. The other thing is, again, if we're all going to work from eight to five, what happens to cars during the days? And one of the, you know, possibly is giant parking lots are gonna be needed. And they're not gonna be built in downtown Phoenix because the land is too valuable. So where are they gonna be built? And how are we as a community going to respond if we get requests for just a giant parking lot that takes autonomous vehicles while they're not being used? Again, another possibility that might be in our future, near, near term future. Um, and again, just looking at the, you know, there's always cycles to this. And I just wanted to run through a quick little example. This isn't Times Square, but this is New York in the early 1900s. And you can see it's all horses and carriages and a gazillion pedestrians. But this is Times Square. And it, you know, on the left is in the 80s, I believe, or 90s. And, um, still very car dominated and now they've turned Times Square into a complete pedestrian area. So there's always cycles to development. You know, we're going to probably, you know, respond one way to autonomous vehicles and then 10, 20 years later, we're going to respond another way and it'll keep evolving. Um, but the likely impacts is there is change coming. No matter what it is, there are definitely gonna be changes. And you know what, 
national planners are telling us is that the suburbs are the battlefields, um, if you will, because again, um, urban areas are naturally going to be inclined to those more utopian, but suburbs are the ones who are going to be asked to lease out right away. Can I build this giant parking lot? You know, and and those tough questions. Um, and really, it just seems like adaptability is going to be important. We're going to need to be able to respond to these things quickly. And it just important is that too. Great places are always going to be important. As humans, we want places to gather and connect and have fun. So continuing on this path of building parks and you know, centers of great places to go and have fun is still always going to be important. Mm -hmm. um, other changes I just want to mention is, you know, artificial intelligence is changing things a lot. Automation. Um, drones is a picture of a passenger drone. So all, everything I just said may be irrelevant because we'll just use passenger drones instead. Um, but the other one I wanted to specifically point out is 3D printing. And there are companies, Adidas is one, who is doing a lot of 3D printing. Um, so again, as a city that has a lot of distribution centers, not just from the autonomous vehicle side, but what is 3D printing going to do to these industries? But it's also not just stuff you think of. And I know it's getting late, but you know, yes, this is a 3D printed home built in 24 hours. Having strong, sturdy walls. This one, uh, there was a better part of the video. Yes. Our first product is a 3D printer that can print a house in 24 hours for half the cost. Phase one for new. So he goes into more detail, so I'll just skip some of that. But um, again, you know, I mean, everything, my department, everything from, are we even going to need planner viewers? Because, you know, they just use a you know, software to build the house to what does this do to housing in general? Um, and that's a technology that's going to keep adapting. You know, it's the house is small, but that's because 3D printers, it can only be as big as the 3D printer, but that'll continue to change and adapt as well. So all sorts of amazing things happening right now. Um, but again, you know, so what do we do? Um, I think all we can really do is keep watching and learning as much as we can, um, try and build that adaptability and flexibility into everything we do. And again, like I kind of mentioned, is keep, keep focusing on gathering places and pedestrian bike routes and complete streets because people still want to walk and have fun and get together. And um, then, again, I also, we're going to get requests from the private market, you know, and we're going to have to give those thoughtful consideration. And I don't think that autonomous vehicles are going to save the world, but I think there's room for cautious optimism that there is a lot of good. You know, like one thing I didn't mention is, you know, just the idea of people being more mobile into older age where, you know, people used to be stuck at home and now with autonomous vehicles, we have this incredible opportunity to keep people as part of society. And that's one of the things that's going to drive it because those people are going to be in need and we have the baby boomers turning, you know, I think they're, we have now hit that baby boomer, there's 10,000 people 
forget what it is every every year, every day, something retiring. So in 10 years, the baby boomer generation is going to start hitting ages where driving is going to be more difficult, and that's going to drive the market to make some of these changes. And it's very, very exciting because now you have people part of the private market who are going to buy things, and they're not going to be isolated, but it means the change will happen fast. <laughs> so, yeah, I know it's late. That's the presentation. I can try and answer questions. Thank you. Um... <laughs> Patrick asked me to close out the meeting yeah. because he wanted to run off and buy stock in Waymo. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this is a really good presentation. And if you haven't already planned on it, I s wonder if you're going to, s to present it to city council as well. I think you should. And I think you should invite the public so that they can see just how forward thinking our department is. And it'll just get a lot of people excited. So I think you should present it about another five or ten times and <laughs> expect lots and lots of questions. Um, thank you personally for doing this. I didn't mean to throw more work on your back, but I thought you guys might like this. Mm -hmm. um, when I read about what autonomous cars were becoming, I thought that it was as big a deal as when we went from the horse and buggy to the car. Mm -hmm. I just I see massive implications like you've shown me. And hopefully they they go good. But with that, let me ask if any of the commission has questions. Actually, I, I do. Um, you know, we have all these distribution centers out here. Has anybody showed interest in, in developing this kind of thing, these cars? They haven't approached the city, but I cannot imagine that a company like UPS is not paying very, very close attention and is – on top of this, mm -hmm. they may be keeping their secrets close to the vest. And then, of course, we have Amazon here. Yeah. Who, I mean, oh, they've got a. I mean, they, I, we already know they've tested drones and all sorts of things. So I'm, I'm sure that they are. Have you also... seen Elf? It's a, um, it's a, it's basically a bicycle, but they put a bubble over it, mm -hmm. and you can sit in it, and it's maybe a three wheeler, and <laughs> you can put your groceries in it, and and it's 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 quite cool, you, you know. And it's big enough so that you can, you know, you're not in the elements if it's mm -hmm. raining or, you know, and you can put your groceries in the back of it. And they have, um, instead of the bike lanes, the bike lanes are a little bit larger. And um, it was really interesting. Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. You know, Katie, I attended a seminar on disruptive technology. <laughs> okay. And the curve starts out very slow mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden spikes up reason being is that every new innovation exponentially gives birth to other new inventions new technologies and those in turn so it it just exponentially increases so that's why you see this sharp spike now according to this seminar by the year 2022, now whether this is going to be true or not or come to pass, is that almost every home will have an AEV in the garage, okay, an, an, auto, an autonomous electric vehicle. Um, also, the singularity, if you're not, are you familiar with that? The singularity 10 years ago was in 2000, or yeah, 2050. Now, the singularity is where artificial intelligence meets our own intelligence and then surpasses it that needle's been pushed closer to where we are today mm -hmm. because of all this exponential birthing to new technologies so it, it's just uh, it's going to continue and uh, you're very much on target with what you're saying and it's just going to continue to develop so i thought your presentation was very good thank you for that mm. Thank Interesting. Excellent. Excellent. Katie, the only thing I thank you and ditto on the great job. The only thing I'd share is some of the technology like the uh, the Robbie, I think it was, is being tested in on private property. I've traveled quite a bit for work and I've been in more than one hotel where if you forget your toothbrush, a little robot comes <laughs> to the door um, and brings it to you. Um or comes and you forgot your key and they send a little robot mm -hmm. also on properties huh. where maybe there are multiple buildings 
of a hotel or resort property and a little robot is going around doing little little things. So it's an interesting way for that technology to be tested before it gets out in the, uh, onto public property and so forth. So I really think they should send you to some of those destinations so you could do some research. I do too. On that. <laughs> <laughs> well, All thank, of the above. Thank you again. Thank you. And if there's no more business before this commission, I hereby call it adjourned. Oh, wait a minute. I can hit the ground with the camel. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs>